G'day gamers, Ranger Tony here, and with the recent release of Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition, I thought I would do a couple of videos on character creation, in particular Rangers, of course. Um, I've played a lot of Rangers, I think they're a great character class. Um, they are based on, you know, the original character of Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. Uh, there's been influences over the years by other archetypes in various media, in particular if you've read R.A. Salvatore's novels that have Drit Stewarden as a character. Um, the dual-wielding aspect that Rangers have has been uh, influenced by that. Also, I'm a bit of an archery buff, and so this sort of character being out in the wilderness, living by their wits, uh, using bows, uh, as an option as well, is something that I like. Unfortunately, Neverwinter Nights 1 doesn't focus on archery very well. So I will be doing an archery build, but it's not the most effective one that you can get. Talking on the rangers. Um, the pros and cons are pretty straightforward. The They are a martial character, so they uh, are a fighting character. They do... Um, they do. They have 1d10 of health, so you'll be very survivable. You get the two-weapon fighting uh, feats for free, including improved two-weapon fighting, so you'll be able to do uh, lots of um, attacks per round. Um, that ends up being very powerful, because even though you can do less damage than, say, a two-handed sword, the fact that you can do two attacks per round means you can potentially do uh, more damage than a two-handed sword. So I've always felt that dual wielding is the more powerful option in the Neverwinter Nights games. You also get favoured enemies. So these give you um, bonuses to attack on selected enemy types. Um, you get one at first level, and every, I think, four levels after that you can add another one. That ends up making you very powerful against those select types. So you have to be careful which ones you pick, but... Yeah, it can be very good. You have um, skills in stealth. I don't really find it all that useful, but um, some people like it. You don't get any advantages by using stealth, so you don't get any advantages to hit when you attack from stealth, or advantages to damage or anything like that. It's purely if you want to scout out. Um, I don't use it, but um, some people love it. If it was a, if I was on an MMO, or if I was playing on a multiplayer server for Neverwinter Nights, then I would pick the stealth because it has use, but when you're in a party and you have to control every member of that party, uh, and, they are, and they may not have the stealth ability, um, it means you've got to stop them all, tell them to stay where they are, you go into stealth and scout ahead, and then come back and then get them all to follow you again. It's very fiddly and I don't find it all that useful. As a ranger, you also get an animal companion from level 6. Um, that is very powerful, because you've got an animal that fights alongside you. Um, they can become a bit of a uh, protector, a bit of a meat shield, if you like, a bit of a tank. Um, some, of the, some of them are more and less effective than others, but that um, it g basically gives you another, another uh, member of your party, which is powerful in some of these adventures where you have such small parties. Um, and you also, as a ranger, get a limited selection of druid clerical type spells. Um, again, not all that useful in some situations, but they're there. What are the disadvantages of being a ranger? Well, even though you're essentially a fighter, you don't get all the feats of the fighter. So you get fewer feats, so you have to pick the ones that you've got a little bit more carefully. You also don't get weapon specialization, um, so you're not going to be able to do as much damage. The way around that is to look at something that's going to do crits, uh, critical damage, critical hits. Um, and then the other disadvantage is that if you're going to use your two-weapon fighting abilities, you can't use anything but light armor, or no armor, but uh, you know, some armor is better than none. Um, so you're restricted to light armor. I'll talk about armor at the end of the video. It's not as limiting as you might think. Okay, there's three types of builds that you can do with a ranger. There is uh, the strength melee build, where you are essentially a two-weapon fighter going in there, hacking and slashing. There is a dex-based melee build. That's more of a crit 
um, setup. You're going in there using your dexterity primarily. Um, you're going to have much better armor class and better defense. You're not going to do quite as much damage, but you can still be very effective. And then the third build is an archer build. Now, you don't get any special feats as a ranger, no special abilities as a ranger that make archery really all that useful in Neverwinter Nights 1, but you can still be a quite an effective class because you've got that animal me, animal companion from level 6 who can be your sort of meat shield that's out in front while you stand back and, and fill the opponents full of arrows. So that, that can work very well. So I'm just going to uh, pick a module here and we're going to create a new character and see what we what we do when we do this build. Gender is completely irrelevant. There's no advantages or disadvantages to picking male or female in this game, so you pick whatever you want. Um, race. Okay. Humans are the default and actually there's an advantage to being a human because you get an extra feat at first level and you get one extra skill point per level and an initial four extra skills at, at first level. That is a bit of a, a kickstart, particularly the extra feat. Um, as a strength-based melee ranger, we're going to use that extra feat to pick exotic weapons so that we can use the two-bladed sword. I'll talk more about that later. Um, if you didn't want to do that as a choice, if you didn't want to pick uh, that, some of the other options. Elves, the dex bonus in elves is quite good, um, but you've got a, a penalty to constitution. Some of the extra skills that elves have are quite good, some of them to do with um, searching and spotting and and things like that, and listen checks, are actually, you know, they have a good synergy with a ranger build. Um, dwarf. Dwarves having the extra constitution is, an, is a bonus, gives you extra, a few extra hit points, potentially, um, and some of these offensive training against orcs and goblins and, and things like that actually meshes in very well with a ranger build, because you can, um, if you pick the favoured enemies to match those, you're going to get even more bonuses in, in attack. The only problem, of course, playing a non-human is you've got those one less feet at the beginning. But you can get around that. There are ways around it. So dwarves aren't too bad. Um, half, half elves. I don't see the point in half elves. They are literally half an elf, so they have some of the elves' special abilities. Uh, unless you've got a role-playing reason that you want to play one, I never play half elf. I've experimented with most of the other classes as rangers, but I've just never bothered with half elf. Half orcs. The strength bonus that a half-orc has does make it quite useful as a strength-based ranger, um, but you're going to have the same problem that everyone else does, you, that one, one extra feat that you lose by not being a human. The other two, gnomes and halflings, they're very similar in a lot of ways, um, and the big thing is that they suffer from a disadvantage by being small statured. They get extra. They get bonus uh, attack uh, attack rolls um, and bonuses to armor class and things like that against creatures that are larger than them, but they're limited in the weapons that they can use. They can any weapon that is small is considered medium for them, so they can't use anything larger than a short sword one-handed. If they wanted to use a long sword, it's a two-handed weapon for them, and they can't use a great sword, or a great axe, or a halberd, etc., um, etc. Et There's a list there of of all of those things that they cannot use. This then severely limits you as what uh, weapons you can pick, and if anything, you should be going for a dex-based melee fighter um, with a halfling or a gnome. Gnomes do have some good offensive and defensive skills similar to the dwarves, and so that could be an okay option if you wanted to go down that way. Halflings have some bonuses against hide and move silently, and, and they're good with slings. Um, the biggest bow that you can use as a halfling is a short bow, only does 1d6, as opposed to a long bow doing 1d8, so, you know. But, 
if you want to play as a halfling ranger, go ahead because it's still it's still a fun class. But maybe look at my dex based build for that one. I'm going to pick human as I mentioned before, and I'm going to show how I build this. Uh, portrait doesn't matter, so I'm just going to pick anything. Class, well, we're here to do ranger, so of course we'll pick ranger. Really quickly, I'm just going to go through this. Rangers are skilled stalkers and hunters who make their home in the wilds. Their martial skill is nearly equal to the fighter, but they lack the latter's dedication to the craft of fighting. Instead, the ranger focuses his skills and trainings on a specific enemy, a type of creature he bears a vengeful grudge against and hunts above all others. Rangers only accept the role of prote often accept the role of protector, aiding those who live in or travel through the woods. His skills allow him to move quickly and silently in the shadows, especially in natural settings, and he also has special knowledge of certain types of creatures. Finally, an experienced ranger has such a tie to, the na to nature that he can actually draw on natural powers to cast divine spells, such as a druid does, and like a druid, he is often accompanied by an animal companion. The first thing I'm going to note on this is, I like this description except for the fact that it talks about the woods, because in my way of thinking, a druid can live anywhere. Yes, they can live in the woods, but they could just as easily live in the desert, in the snow, they could live underground as a dwarven ranger, they could live in a pastoral setting as, as a halfling ranger might, um, or they could live in a city. A city-based ranger is sort of a bounty hunter or a policeman type of thing. Um, I still think they have that uh, that thing that they accept the role of a protector. They often accept the role of protector, and they help people who would live uh, or travel through the environment that they that they live in. Um, that's all. That yeah, I think that's definitely more the idea of of a ranger to me. It, it, they shouldn't just be in the woods. To cast a spell, a ranger must have a wisdom of ten plus their spells level. Um, you start with a with a wisdom of 11, you can't go lower than that, and that means that you the maximum you want to go to is 14, because you can only get four levels of spells as a ranger. So if you're going to put any points into wisdom, don't go any higher than 14, it's a waste. Uh, you get a d10 for hit dice, which is good. In Neverwinter Nights 2, it's, that's been dropped to a d8, not quite as good. You can use all simple and martial weapons, light and medium armor, and shields. You can't use the medium armor if you're dual wielding, and of course you can't use a shield if you're dual wielding. So you'll be focusing in this build on light armor. Skill points, you get 4 plus your int modifier per level, with 4 times that at the beginning. Uh, as a human, you'll get 5 plus your int per level with five times that at the beginning. Um, and you can cast divine spells, so that's that's fine. Alignment. This is always a tricky one for me. I The original descriptions of rangers in the early versions of D&D was you had to be good, because you were at this protector, this, this guy who looks after wilderness areas or whatever, so you had to be good. They've relaxed that, and I don't think that's a good idea. I don't understand how you can be evil and still be a ranger or someone who wants to protect and nurture a particular environment. It still works with the idea of having favorite enemies, but you become little more than a barbarian who rages at a particular enemy when he sees them type of thing. It's, it's a little bit weird. So that's that. I generally pick chaotic good because I tend to think of the rangers as free-spirited, but there's no reason why you can't be a lawful ranger as well. Um, abilities. Okay, I'm going to go from the bottom up because the most important ability is at the top and we want to fill those last and do it. So charisma is a purely a dump stat. You're not going to want to put points in it. If you start it as anything that has a um, constitu a charisma penalty like a half orc or a dwarf um, that'll be six leave it there don't worry about it you don't really need it some of the skills that use uh, like persuade that use charisma are useful in some modules but there's usually another way to accomplish things even if that means you fight instead of uh, anything else intelligence I recommend keeping your intelligence at 10 so that you don't have a penalty on it because that's going to affect how many skill points you get. And you, as a ranger, you get more skill points than a lot of classes, so use them and don't throw them away. Wisdom. If you want to, to use spells, then put this to 14. I don't find the spells, any of the spells on any of the levels, all that useful. 
Um, so I generally leave it at 11 and then just accept that I'm only going to get first level spells and very few of those and um, work with that. Constitution, again, you want at least 10 here. Based on what race you've picked and things like that, you might be able to bump this up to 12. Um, that's purely up to you, but keeping it at 10 doesn't give you a penalty, so you don't lose hit points. That's the way to go. Dexterity. You're going to want to pump this a little bit because you do want some armor class. Uh, because you're going to be using light armor, you want some extra AC points. So I recommend either 14 to give you a plus 2 or 16 to give you a plus 3. Don't go any lower than that. Don't go any lower than 14, um, and I wouldn't go any higher than 16. And with the exception of wisdom, don't put any of these on on um, odd numbers because you're wasting your points. You only get an increase in the abilities, the the bonuses on the even numbers. So try and remember that. With the exception of strength here, we're going to pump this to as, as much as we can so we can go to 17 there. That's fine because we're, every time we get an increase now, we get a spell, we get a um, skill point, sorry, an ability point. We're going to put that into strength. So that uh, starting at 17 is not a big disadvantage. Uh, within a couple of levels, we'll get another point and we'll go to 18 and that'll be plus four. So that'll be good. Okay, so we're plus three to hit, plus three to armor class. Everything else is, you know, straightforward zeros um, and charisma's down a little bit. Um, the packages. So I wouldn't recommend picking any of these. Um, always do configure packages. I I can't remember if it's in Neverwinter Nights 1 and Neverwinter Nights 2, but at least in Neverwinter Nights 2, when you pick one of these packages and then go configure, you keep that title that you've got in your um, character sheet. So I generally pick something that I like the sound of and then go configure, just because I got into the habit of doing that. I'm going to really quickly go through just the class skills, nothing else, because there's too many to go through and most of them are useless. There's no point putting abilities into any of these that aren't class skills because you won't you have to put two points to get one increase and it's not worth the effort animal empathy sounds great allows you to basically charm or dominate certain creatures so they join your party basically and fight alongside you and you will see the odd creature around you'll see dogs you'll see wolves you'll see cows you'll see things like that but I, I did use them in the original campaign a little bit originally, um, but I found that you've got to, every five minutes or so, you've got to go over and, and reuse the skill on them because otherwise they leave your party. Um, and they're not all that helpful. So I don't really use that skill. Um, there was um, the Shards of Undren Tide. There was an advantage to having a, a skill in that because you could talk to some creatures in at some point and get some information out of them but apart from that it's really useless um, concentration uh, is only useful if you're casting spells in combat or to avoid the taunt skill and frankly in all the modules I've played so far I don't recall ever being taunted so I don't bother with using this the crafting skills they're great if you're role-playing if I was on a multiplayer server or an MMO, I would probably put some skills into this at some point and use them every now and then. But in sing single player modules, they're not worth the the skills. So don't bother with them for any of these. Um, discipline. Discipline is useful for um, defending against disarm, called shot, and knockdown. You don't get these happening a lot. Knockdown is occasionally there'll be a, an opponent which will use that. It's not that not that common um, but I've got the points here so I'm going to put it in it as a human but if you're not playing a human I would recommend probably not picking that heal you're going to be tempted to want to use this I don't think it's really worthwhile potions are fairly cheap and easy to get hold of and um, healing kits do enough da enough repair without having to have a bonus to it that I don't worry about it hide um, hide and and um, move silently are useful skills. Again, if I was on a multiplayer server or an MMO, I would pick some of these. But you have to, if you if you use them in these single player modules, you either you sneak off and the rest of the party just runs along behind you, which 
makes it useless because they'll see the rest of the party. Or you've got to tell the party to stop. You go and sneak forward, see what's there, come back, tell your party to follow you, and then go in and fight. It's a lot of fiddling. I don't bother with it. Listen is useful because you can often hear or spot a creature, an opponent, from a distance. So I always put some points into listen. Lore is one of those, if you don't want to have to wait until you get back to town or you don't have anyone in your party who can cast identify law is useful because it doesn't always work but it allows you to identify some things and having to you know pass up on not being able to use an item because it's not identified is a pain so I put points into that but if you're not worried about it then don't use it put the points somewhere else parry parry is a bit of a contentious skill some people love it a lot of people hate it the biggest thing that I'll say about it, the limitation is, it only works if something is attacking you. If there is an opponent and you have a party of, of um, companions and the opponent is attacking one of your companions and not attacking your character and you turn on parry, your character will stand there and do absolutely nothing because you're waiting for someone to attack you so that you can parry. It doesn't still allow you to attack and then also parry when the opportunity arises, it means stand there and do nothing except parry attacks. So you end up having to turn it on and off a lot um, as your opponent switches from attacking you to attacking someone else. Um, so I tend not to use it, but it doesn't mean it's useless. It does work, and it does work fairly well when you, when you turn it on and when you are being attacked, but um, it's a lot of management. Ride. Ride is only useful in the one module. Never win a knight's wife and crown of Cormier. If you're not doing that, don't put points in it. If you are, then it is probably worthwhile because there is riding in that module, so spend the points. Search. Search is useful to detect traps, and because you're probably going to be at the front of your party, and uh, you'll want that. You, I think you get a bonus to that as a ranger anyway. Um, and if you're playing an elven ranger, you'll get even more of a bonus because elves can do search without having to slow down. Everyone else, when you do search, it halves your movement rate, but not for elves and dwarves. Um, so that's that. Set trap. Traps are too finicky. Um, it's too hard to ensure that your opponents are actually going to run over the trap and be trapped, so I tend not to use them. But if you are if you find that you can use them, then go ahead and use them. But I've tried them and just had no real luck with them. Spot, as I said with listen, is useful to determine hidden opponents or opponents that are you know in the room next to you or whatever. So I always pick that. That becomes useful. And then maybe later on, if you've got the skill point, the feature points available, get blind fighting as well, because that helps you if your opponent's invisible, like this one does. Available feats. Now, I'm going to... Normally, the feats, if I wasn't doing a this exact build, would be to get power attack as the first one, and I still recommend getting that. Um, and if you're not playing a human, get power attack as your first skill, and then look at getting cleave as your second skill. Power attack is not all that useful. It um, gives you a plus five bonus to damage, but it gives you a minus five penalty to attack. So a bit of a trade-off there. But it allows you to get cleave. And what cleave does is when you kill an opponent, you get a free attack against another opponent who's within range. That becomes really powerful. It's only a melee skill, so it doesn't work with bows, but it's really powerful. And eventually there's a uh, the next version of that is called Great Cleave, and once you can get that, um, you can keep, you get as many attacks as you can. If, if each attack, each extra cleave attack, if that kills an opponent, you get another one, and you keep going. Um, and I've seen my characters with that just absolutely churn their way through um, low-level creatures with that ability. It's, it's wonderful to see. Um, I'm not going to take that now, though, because instead I'm going to pick Weapon Proficiency Exotic, because we want to use a two-bladed sword, and I'll explain in a minute why. When we go and have a look at a build that's at a higher level, we'll see what the two-bladed sword does. That's good. It's a ridiculous weapon in reality, but it if you play it by these rules, it works well. So, favorite enemy is our next choice. There's a lot of things that you can pick here for favorite enemy. Uh, I would s recommend uh, researching the module that you're playing and seeing what sort of opponents are in that and picking those. But you get 
another favourite enemy. You get several of them throughout the game, so you get them every four levels or whatever it is. So you get to pick multiple. Things that are worth picking are whatever creatures are in the module. If you know that there's goblinoids or there's orcs or whatever, pick those. But also some common ones that are useful to pick are undead, because pretty much every module will always have undead. And then other options are things like outsiders tend to be a strange category. A lot of things that if you can't think, oh, there's, you know, illithids, for example, mind flayers. What category are they in? Well, they're in outsider. Um, and aberrations is another one, although there's only a couple of creatures in aberrations in Neverwinter Nights 1, so be careful on that one. Um, dragons are always a good option. And then, you know, if you're playing an adventure where there's a lot of humans, picking things like humans or elves or dwarves or things like that as opponents isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, if you're playing... Um, the Underdark modules, then pick Elves, because there might be Dark Elves in there, or pick Dwarves, because there might be Grey Dwarves in there. Um, you're not necessarily picking, you know, going to kill Surface Elves, but um, you can get that ability. So I'm going to pick... Uh, also, um, Goblinoids covers a fair group of creatures, from Goblins to Hobgoblins to Ogres, and Reptilian Humanoids is another one that's a good group, because it picks... it does kobolds, it does uh, troglodytes, and lizard men, and um, there's a lizard, uh, an aquatic lizard man, I can't think of, it, of the name of it now, but it, it covers all of those. Things like that, uh, if you don't know what to pick, pick things like goblinoids as your first one, and then pick undead as your second, and then whatever else you need to as you go along, if, you, if you're starting to get an idea as what the opponents in the module might be. You might pick um, fey, or you might pick aberrations, or you might pick magical beasts, but also go and look them up, what those um, groups actually entail. I'm going to pick goblinoids for this one. Uh, so that's our feats selected. We're, the, the rest of the customization is just to pick um, the look, and that's really a very personal thing. So I'm not going to go through that anymore. What I'm going to do is, sh as I said, show you a couple of characters that I had previously built. So this is the standard strength-based ranger. This was playing the um, Pirates of the Sword Coast module. It's right near the very end. So this character is at level 12. Um, a plus 6 to strength, um, which isn't actually as high as another example I'm going to show you in a minute. But you'll see here that my bonus, my, my attack is 19 is my, my highest, plus 19 is my highest attack. Um, and that's because the two-bladed sword, unlike if I switch to these two weapons here, now these are both plus two long swords, and that's a plus two two-bladed sword. You'll notice that this is three points less. Now, it's two points less than this normally would be, but I've also got weapon focus, which gives me a plus one to that. So you take the weapon focus, this is the, to hit, the attack bonus is two points less for these because you've got two la two medium-sized weapons, one in each hand. What the two-bladed sword has is the advantage that you don't get that penalty for having the two weapons. Um, it Because it's considered to be one weapon, you don't get that two medium-sized weapon penalty, uh, which is good. It allows you to do a bit of extra damage. Now, the other thing, the other skills that I recommend you, the feats that I recommend that you get after you've gotten cleave, you'll need to get weapon focus in whatever weapon you've chosen. So in this case, I've got weapon focus. If we have a look over here, I'll show you what I've got. I've got cleave. I picked up dodge because I was waiting to get another ability. Um, I picked up weapon focus in two-bladed sword and then I was able to get improved critical in two-bladed sword and that's what you're going to need to do as a ranger you need, need to concentrate on crits because you can't do as much damage as a fighter a fighter using the same sword would also have weapon specialization which gives them a plus two to damage right with whatever weapon they choose they have to choose the weapon but you know if you choose two-bladed sword as the weapon that you want to specialize in you would be doing an extra two damage to that with that as well you can't get that so concentrate on crits so the normal crit range for a two-bladed sword is 19 or 20. if you roll a 19 or 20 you will crit and you'll do twice the damage if you get improved critical it in, it improves that it doubles that range so it becomes 17 to 20. so if we go and have a look at 
this weapon. Sorry, not this weapon. If we have a look over here, you can see the crit range is 17 to 20. If you then have a weapon that is also keen, which adds to that again, that triples it, so it's now 17 to 20. Um, that means that I think that's about 30%. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. Yeah, 30% of the time you're going to crit with this weapon. Um, and that is, that is how, as a ranger, you're going to do your extra damage. Now, as I said before, there is one other character that I want to show you, and that is another strength-based ranger, but even more focused on crits, because if you pick the right weapon, you can do even more damage when you crit. So let's just switch to these. There we go. So this is using scimitars, and scimitars have a different crit range to other weapons. The scimitar has a crit of 18 to 20, rather than 19 to 20 for a longsword. Some weapons only have 20 as their crit. Their axes, for example, only do crits on 20, but they are they do three times the damage. Um, so I have improved crit on this, so rather than it being 18 to 20, it's now 15 to 20. And if I pick the weapons that have keen on them, that can now be 20, t 12 to 20, No. That is now 12 to 20, which is 45% uh, of the time this weapon is going to do a crit. So the disadvantage of using these two weapons is the attack bonus is going to be slightly less. I've got a plus 7 here. So this would normally be um, 20 with a plus 7, I think, um, if this was a two-bladed sword. The... So it's doing less it's doing less damage, first of all, because this only does 1d6 rather than 1d8 per weapon. Um, but you are critting way more often. But also, if you're going to enchant these, you've got two weapons that you have to enchant now, whereas the, the two-bladed sword, you only have to enchant one thing. So it's going to cost you a little bit more to keep these two weapons going. That's, that's a disadvantage. I said I was going to talk about armor, so let's really briefly do that. You get a dex bonus, so our dex bonus here is 3. Your armor has a maximum rating on it that determines what the maximum dex bonus is that it will handle, and this armor, being studded leather, has a maximum of 4. So, the thing is though, is if you add up the armor class and the, the dex bonus, they always, in every suit of armor, either equal 7 or 8, with one exception, full plate goes to 9. So, if you can keep your decks maxed out, or close to maxed, for each type of armor that you're using, you're probably going to have 7 or 8 armor class. Well, plus 10, so 17 or 18 armor class, and then whatever bonuses, other bonuses you get on top of that. So I've got a bunch of magical items here, and it, this is plus 3. So together that all makes it 25. But yeah, if my armor, if my dexterity bonus was plus five, there would be no use in using this armor because that extra one bonus wouldn't be used. It wouldn't be giving me three and five is eight, it would still be giving me three and four is seven for the armor. So that's something to be aware of. That negative, that, that fact that you don't get the full bonus doesn't affect your ability with a bow, or if you're using weapon focus to attack with your dexterity, but be aware it does affect your saving throws that are dexterity based. So if you tried to slap full plate mail armor on this character, their dex bonus would drop to one for any dex saves. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. The next video in this series, I'm going to be talking about a dex-based melee build, and then I'll be talking about an archery melee build. So, thanks for watching, and keep on gaming. Bye.